Let's just pray. Almighty Father, look with mercy on this your family, for which the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ was content to be betrayed and given up into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who is alive and glorified with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen. So welcome to our uh, service for Good Friday as we spend some time at the cross uh, this evening. It's going to be a service of uh, readings and hymns uh, to listen to, as unfortunately we're still not allowed to sing. Uh, and usually uh, in the middle of the service we'd have some time where you could come and stand in front of the cross that we've got here, but again unfortunately we're not allowed to do that uh, this year, um, so everything will be uh, in your seats. So we're going to start by listening to our first hymn. A reading from the prophecy of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there are many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. And he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, 
we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. You should all have Psalm 22 in front of you. We're going to say it all together. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? and are so far from my salvation, from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer, and by night also, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One, enthroned upon the praises of Israel. Our forebears trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They put their trust in you and were not confounded. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delights in him. But it is you that took me out of the womb and laid me safe upon my mother's breast. On you was I cast ever since I was born. You are my God, even from my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near at hand, and there is none to help. Mighty oxen come around me, fat bulls of Bashan close me in on every side. They gape upon me with their mouths, as it were a ramping and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has become like wax, melting in the depths of my body. My mouth is dried up like a potherd. My tongue cleaves to my gums. You have laid me in the dust of death, for the hands are all about me. The pack of evildoers close in on me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stand staring and looking upon me. They divide my garments among them. They cast lots for my clothing. Be not far from me, O Lord. You are my strength. Hasten to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword my poor life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, from the horns of wild oxen. You have answered me. I will tell of your name to my people. 
In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. O seed of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, O seed of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the suffering of the poor. Neither has he hidden his face from them. But when they cried to him, he heard them. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. I will perform my vows in the presence of those that fear you. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord shall praise him. Their hearts shall live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. How can those who sleep in the earth bow down to worship, or those who go down to the dust kneel before him? He has saved my life for himself. My descendants shall serve him. This shall be told of the Lord for generations to come. They shall come and make known his salvation to a people yet unborn declaring that he, the Lord, has done it. Now by New Testament reading. <coughs> reading is taken from Hebrews 10 verses 16 to 25. The Holy Spirit says, This is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice of sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart full of assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who is promised is faithful. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord.
John beginning at his 18th chapter. When Jesus had finished praying, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it that you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Jesus the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you were looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name is Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of, father of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You are not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood round the fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I have always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? he demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Annas sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked, You are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a cock began to crow. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning. And to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words that Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realise I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a, at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to, Jew to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them. 
with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them, and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, and put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened, so the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look at the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I'm going to read some reflections on uh, the crucifixion narrative, and these have been written by Tim Chester from his book, The Glory of the Cross. With hushed tones, we stand before the cross. For the soldiers gambling for Jesus' garments, it was just another day, another crucifixion. But John points us beyond the events to see their meaning. Twice in this account, he talks about the fulfilment of Scripture. The night before, Jesus had humbly removed his outer clothing to wash the disciples' feet. Now that love goes further, as he's stripped of his undergarment as well. But this one-piece undergarment can't be split between the soldiers, so they cast lots for it. It's such a small incident, given everything else that's taken place. 
but it fulfills what David had said in Psalm 22. David was Israel's greatest king, the archetypal king, but Psalm 22 is a reminder that he was also a suffering king. So the sufferings of Jesus don't invalidate his, day, his claim to be the Messiah, God's promised king. Quite the opposite. The fact that he suffers like David proves his claim. John makes a similar point with his second reference to the fulfilment of scripture. Jesus says, I am thirsty, echoing another psalm, Psalm 6, in which David said, they give me vinegar for my thirst. But there is more going on with this declaration of thirst. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus has been the thirst quencher. In chapter 4 he says, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In chapter 6 he says, Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In chapter 7, he says, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, streams of living water will flow from within them. But to be the thirst quencher, Jesus must thirst. He experiences the emptiness we deserve, that we might be filled. He is cut off from God, that we might be satisfied in God. We also need to go back to the first miracle that Jesus performed at the wedding of Cana. Then, in a moment of need, Jesus turned water into wine. And not just any old wine, but the best of wine. It was a powerful symbol of the new life he was bringing that would sweep away the old, broken religious systems. But now, at his moment of need, Jesus himself is offered, offered wine vinegar the worst of wine. Jesus gets the worst to give us the best. Sometimes we're tempted to feel short-changed by life, but when we look at the cross, we see it isn't so. Jesus dies to quench our thirst with the very best. Yet John highlights the fulfilment of scripture, not simply to point us to the meaning of the cross. He also wants to demonstrate that this was not all thought out, that, sorry, that this was all thought out in advance. What's happening is not happening by chance. Events for Jesus have not spun out of his control. It's all part of the plan, the eternal plan, agreed between the Father and the Son, promised in the Old Testament. Though Jesus is dying, he's still in control. As he says in John chapter 10, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. This is all part of the plan, the plan to save you. The last words of the playwright George Bernard Shaw spoken to his nurse were, Sister, you're trying to keep me alive as an old curiosity, but I'm done. I'm finished. I'm going to die. Shaw's life was over and nothing could be done for him. At first sight, the last words of Jesus in John's account are similar. It is finished. But the meaning of these words was very different. The passion of Jesus is finished. This is not the end of the earth, sorry, this is the end of the earthly life of Jesus. But this is not a cry of defeat. From the beginning, when the guards arrested Jesus, fell before him, to this final moment, everything points to the triumph of Jesus. Jesus is in control. He lays down his life of his own accord. And throughout his gospel, John has spoken of Jesus as exalted on the cross. This is a cry of triumph. So too, the work of the Father is finished. The previous night, as he looked ahead to the events of the first Good Friday, Jesus had prayed, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. The Father gave Jesus a job to do, to reveal God to the world and to reconcile the world to God. And now that job has been completed. 
On the cross, Jesus is revealing the full extent of God's love and he is reconciling humanity to God by covering our sin. And the plan of salvation is finished. Moments before Jesus uttered his final words, we read, Knowing that everything had now been finished, and so the scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. That same word, finished, is used both by John in verse 28 and by Jesus in verse 30. It is finished because scripture is fulfilled. The plan of salvation, conceived in eternity and promised in scripture, has reached its climax. Think what that means for a moment. It is finished doesn't simply point to the meaning of the cross. It points to the meaning of history. In eternity past, father and son conceived a plan which had this moment as its centrepiece. The universe, every star and galaxy, was created to set the stage for this moment in the drama of God's love. And wonderfully, the striving of God's people is finished. It is finished are words we need to keep on hearing. We need to say them to ourselves. We need to say them to one another. That's because we so easily default back to thinking that we need to make ourselves good enough for God. We think we need to prove ourselves. Some of us are over busy because we find our identity in our work. Some of us fill our lives with restless activity because we desperately seek fulfilment. Some of us self-harm to atone for the guilt that nags at our souls. Some of us find that no matter how much we do, it never seems enough. And all the time Jesus says, it is finished. Everything that is needed has been done. In those days, it is finished was written on a bill when it had been paid. It was the first century equivalent of paid in full. Jesus has written over your life, paid in full. As the Chinese church leader Watchman Nee said, Christianity begins not with a big do, but with a big done. Stop striving. It is finished. We're going to have some time to think on those words, think about uh, the Bible readings we've heard. Uh, as we uh, look at the cross, as Palestrina plays uh, some music for us.
Let us pray. God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. Therefore, we pray to our Heavenly Father for people everywhere according to their needs. In our prayers, when I say, Lord, hear us, can you please respond, Lord, graciously hear us. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Let us pray for the Church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, for bishops and other ministers, and those whom we serve for the bishops in our diocese and the people of our diocese, for all the Christians in this place, for those to be baptised, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love and preserve it in peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord gracious be us. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for the nations of the world and their leaders, for Elizabeth, our Queen, and the parliaments of this land, for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation, that by God's help the world may live in peace and freedom. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit the peace which is founded on justice may be established throughout the world. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word, for greater understanding between Christian and Jew, for the removal of our blindness and bitterness of heart, that God will grant us grace to be faithful to his covenant and to grow in the love of his name. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Lord God of Abraham, bless the children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. When the Gentiles shall be gathered in, all Israel shall be saved, and we shall dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe the Gospel of Christ, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all who have lost faith, for the contemptuous and scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience.
Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Merciful God, creator of all the people of the earth, have compassion on all who do not know you, and by the preaching of your gospel with grace and power, gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all those who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and in fear, for prisoners, captives and refugees, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death, and those who watch beside them, that God in his mercy will sustain them with the knowledge of his love. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Almighty and everlasting God, the comfort of the sad and the strength of those who suffer, hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble, and to every distressed soul grant mercy, <coughs> relief and refreshment, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all God's children to his unfailing love, and pray for the grace of a holy life that with all who have died in the peace of Christ, we may come to the fullness of eternal life and the joy of the resurrection. Lord, hear us. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, Look favourably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, and by the tranquil operation of your perpetual providence, carry out the work of our salvation, and let the whole world feel and see that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are returning to perfection through him from whom they took their origin. Even Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Standing at the foot of the cross, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and to give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever.
our service this evening is going to finish uh, with a final prayer, um, but do feel free to stay as long as you want to. Um, the church will be open uh, for as long as you need it to be. If you want to stay and pray uh, or come up and uh, have a look at the cross, um, that's fine. The church will be open as long as you need it to. So let us pray. The Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set your passion, cross and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son Jesus Christ delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.